Morena e te whanau, kia ora koutou, hmm. and welcome everyone to the September ECA market update. Hmm. Given that it is Māori Language Week, hmm. we thought that we'd start with a uh, karakia today and one that um, we've chosen for two reasons. One, because it draws on the force of the winds, which is a really great <laughs> renewable energy message. Um, but secondly, because last year when uh, around 80 ECA staff did their Te Reo courses, uh, this was the one that we all had to learn off by heart. So um, two reasons there. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga, ki a mā kina kina, ki uta, ki a mā tara tara, ki tai, e hi aki ana te atā kura, he tiu, he huka, he hauhu, te hei Māori ora. Right, let's crack into it. Slides, thanks, Leroy. And we've got a really varied range of presenters for you this morning from right across ECA. We're quite excited to be uh, introducing our new CE, Dr. Marcus Palanu. Uh, we've got Michael on Giddy Clean Tech, Sarah Cooper, who's in our research evaluation and insights team on uh, these really significant RMA changes. We have Camilla, the manager of our transport group, and then we have our um, our uh, fantastic MC, Glenn, taking care of us. Next, thanks. So this is my bit, just to run through the awful lot that's happened in three months. And every time we get to this, we can't quite believe that the pace is, is still the same as it is. We announced the Fonterra deal. This is our, our biggest item this quarter, buying a commitment from Fonterra to increase its carbon abatement ambition by an additional 20% by 2030, which equates to 2.1 million tonnes of earlier CO2 reductions, or nearly 3% of all New Zealand's required emissions reductions between 2026 and 2030. It's a value for money deal that comes in at a forecast cost to government of $43 a tonne of emissions, and that's about the same as Giddy Round 5 and well below the cost of buying offshore credits. In Giddy Industrial, our Round 5 projects were, now, were announced and our first always-on application was approved. Mm. So including steel, our annual abatement is now over 1.2 million tonnes of CO2 emissions per annum and lifetime over 25 million tonnes abated and that's absolutely fantastic. In Giddy Commercial Buildings, we've opened our $40 million fund and we've received our first applications. Mm. Our Giddy Clean Tech hot water heat pump grants are now live and we've got applications coming in. We've got many of these applications. Our West Coast Regional ETA was, report, was, was published. Mm. And so we're now in nine regions and we have four reports published, all of which are on our website. And then finally, mm. We were there and our co-funding supported the launch of New Zealand, in fact, the uh, Southern Hemisphere's first electric tractor at Forest Lodge Orchard. So before I hand over to introduce our new CE, Marcos, I know that many of you will be here having questions around um, how ECA is navigating the next few months. And we've prepared some guidance for you, and this may even head, up, head off some of the questions that you may have at the end. So yes, it is uncertain about whether programs such as Giddy funded through ETS revenues will continue to be offered in their current form. We acknowledge that uncertainty. You need to take this into account when you're making decisions about investing time and resources into applying for ECA funding or responding to ECA RFPs, which we will continue to put into market. You should look to publicly provided information about respective parties' positions, but know that all contractual arrangements already entered into with ECA will continue on the terms that are agreed in those arrangements. And also know that currently ECA's approval and contracting functions are operating as business as usual. So with what we hope is a bit of clarity for you around that, I'm now really excited to hand over to our new CE, Marcos, and uh, let him introduce himself. Thanks, Nikki. Sorry, I got to jump in to Nikki's spot because it's day three here and uh, all my IT was working brilliantly until just right before this meeting. And then my camera and Zoom functions decided to go on early leave. So uh, all good. Nice to see uh, 
thank you for coming. Nice to be here. Um, just introduce myself. I won't take more than a few minutes. Just say thank you. First off, you know, acknowledge the work that you've been doing in this space, the work together that you've been partnering with ICA and ourselves. We really enjoy uh, engaging with industry and with the market. And so we can't accomplish the government goals um, without your support and without all the good mahi and work that you do. So I just want to first off acknowledge that. I'm Marcus uh, Pelliner. I'm a trained engineer as background. I've been, I've worked as an engineer in Auckland in energy management systems, smart meters. I got very interested in energy efficiency and sustainable development. And so for the last um, 10 plus years, I've been working in the public sector. I am very passionate, um, you know, from that background around energy efficiency, I'm very passionate. I think this is a little bit of the engineering around efficient and effective use of resources. I think as a country, we have so much to benefit with energy efficiency, and that's why I'm, I'm very excited to be here with ECA and the role. The things that I'm hoping to accomplish, at least the, the early ideas on day three of what I'm hoping to accomplish is really just trying to deliver on our focus areas as an organization. So supporting productive and low emission businesses supporting energy efficient homes and uh, an efficient and low emission transport system. I think if we can do that, there's just going to be ripple positive effects for everyone in society and, and Kiwis everywhere. So industry, you know, it's kind of like a win win. If we can improve productivity, that's a, you know, that's a win for the environment, but it's also a win for uh, New Zealand's economy more broadly. I do want to acknowledge, you know, the challenges at the moment inflationary pressures, um, cost of doing business, labor shortages. I know it is um, you are facing a, a number of different challenges in, in the context. I've just come back. Uh, I you know, don't let the Canadian accent fool you. I have been here for, for almost 20 years in New Zealand, but I did just uh, spend the last two years back in Canada I have seen, um, even in North America, where there's a lot of uncertainty around decarbonization and, and what's going there, I've actually seen a lot of positive opportunities emerge for businesses and industry. And so I guess what I'm saying is that um, even with the sort of uncertainty or the challenges that are out in the market, I think that there's, there's a lot of opportunities to do good and be successful. And I've seen a lot of the positive outcomes and businesses grow through this kind of transition opportunity while achieving the environmental goals or, or helping achieve environmental goals and improving economic uh, performance. So I just wanted to leave on, on that note. Uh, I want to wish you guys have a great rest of a quarterly update. And if you, um, yeah, if you're in Wellington and want to say hi, just drop uh, me or the ECA team a line. Thanks. And we can, with, with that, thank you, we can head over to the next slide, Leroy. Mm -hmm. So we're going to uh, run through, we're going, to, we're going to hear first on the National Direction for Greenhouse Gas um, with Sarah. Then we will uh, be spending some time looking at hot water heat pump examples from the field with Michael. Mm -hmm. Camilla will follow with what's new in transport decarbonisation and then we have time for questions. So I'll hand straight over to Sarah Cooper. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, kia ora koutou. My name is Sarah Cooper and I'm a Senior Advisor in the Research, Evaluations and Insights team at ECA. I will be presenting today on the Government's new National Direction on Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Process Heat that came into a force in July this year. These new regulations affect industries that use fossil fuels and heat devices such as boilers, furnaces, engines or other combustion devices to generate industrial process heat. Ministry for the Environment or MFE, um, Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, also known as MB and ECA have been working closely over the last few years to develop and implement the National Direction on Industrial Greenhouse Gas Emissions. 
MFE and MB are the lead policy agencies due to MFE's role in climate change policy and resource management, and MB due to their role in energy policy. ECA is a Crown agency that encourages, supports and promotes energy efficiency, energy conservation and the use of renewable energy in New Zealand. ECA has played a key role in developing non-statutory guidance on emissions plans and best available techniques reference documents to support the national direction. Next slide, please. So what is the new national direction? The new policy and regulations require regional councils to factor in greenhouse gas emissions produced by fossil fuels used for industrial process heat when assessing resource consent applications. This new national direction is a key tool in reducing New Zealand's energy related emissions. The policy and regulations will help manage the discharge to air of greenhouse gases from fossil fuels used in industrial process heat thereby reducing their harmful effects on climate change. The National Direction Framework consists of two key documents, the National Policy State Statement, or NPS, and the National Environmental Standard, also known as the NES. The NPS sets out national objectives and supporting policy framework to guide decisions on resource consents required under the NES. The NES sets nationally consistent rules for greenhouse gas emission, emitting activities from industrial process heat. It also sets out the matters of discretion to which decision makers are restricted to when considering resource consent applications and when imposing conditions under the NES. Uh, the NES and NPS both came into force on the 27th of July, 2023. Next slide, please. The purpose of the National Direction. Uh, the policy objectives of the National Direction are consistent with the purposes of the Resource Management Act. So that is to promote the sustainable management of natural resources and will assist New Zealand's broader climate change goals. The purpose of the NPS and NES is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from industries using fossil fuel to generate industrial process heat by Avoiding or prohibiting new fossil fuel fired dis discharged discharges used in process heat and a more rigorous approach for coal fired heat devices compared to other fossil fuel heat devices. Also accelerating the phase out of fossil fuels and supporting the transition to lower lower emissions fuels for existing industrial process heat devices. Finally, developing and in implementing greenhouse gas emissions plans that support best practice to reduce emissions and transition to low emissions alternatives. Next slide, please. Who will the NPS and NES apply to? Uh, these policy and regulations will af affect industries that use fossil fuels and heat devices, such as boilers, furnaces, engines, or other combustion devices to generate industrial process heat. However, they do not apply to emissions from non-fossil fuel used in industrial processes or businesses using fossil fuel fired heat devices to heat space and water in commercial buildings. In this national direction, industrial process heat is defined as thermal energy used in industrial processes, including in the manufacturing of products and the processing of raw materials. And in horticulture, when industrial heat is used to grow plants or other photosynthesizing organisms indoors. Definitions for heat device, fossil fuel, industrial process heat, low and, emissions, uh, low and high emission sites and backup devices can be found in the NES on MFE's website. Next slide, please. Exemptions are, are provided in the regulations for discharges of greenhouse gases these include backup devices that operate for 400 hours or less each year and also low emission sites, which are defined as sites that emit less than 500 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year from thermal energy. Next slide, please. Emission, emissions plan requirement. 
Uh, so now resource consent applications must include an emissions plan setting out actions and methods to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the proposed activity. This encourages best practice in energy efficiency and reduces greenhouse gas emissions over time. The NES outlines the purpose and contents of an emissions plan. However, ECA is also developing guidance on preparing and assessing emissions plans. The emissions plan forms part of the resource consent application, and if the consent is approved, compliance with an emissions plan must be a condition on a consent. Emissions plans for heat devices on high emission sites, which are sites that burn fossil fuels emitting more than 2,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent each year, must be reviewed by a suitably qualified person. MFE have developed a fact sheet on attributes of a suitably qualified person, which can be found on their, their website if you need more information on that. Next slide, please. How soon must a resource consent be applied for? A resource consent will need to be applied for immediately for a new heat device discharging at or above the consent threshold of 500 tonnes of CO2 equivalent of thermal energy per year per site. For existing heat devices discharging at or above the consent threshold of 500 tonnes CO2 equivalent per year, the resource consent will need to be applied on the date of expiry for heat devices operating under an existing discharge to air consent. If operating under permitted rules and a regional plan, a consent will need to be applied for before the 26th of January 2025. Next slide, please. Resources in development. As mentioned earlier, ECA will soon publish non-statutory guidance to help regional councils and industry with understanding key requirements of the NES and NPS, including emission plan guidance and best available available techniques reference documents. The purpose of the emissions plan guidance is primarily to help councils navigate the new regulations, ensure they are able to implement them in their region, and provide required approach to preparing and assessing an emissions plan. However, this guidance may also be useful to industry, especially consultants who have been hired to help with emissions plans and consent applications. The Emissions Plan Guidance is being co-developed by ECA and Pedal Dalamore Partners, or PDP, who are experts in RMA regulation. An interim version of the guidance will be shared with a small and targeted advisory group, primarily made up of representatives from regional councils for road testing. Following the road testing, this guidance will be refined and a final version will be pub published on our website which is currently expected in October 2023. If you're interested in being involved in the road testing, please contact either myself at sarah.cooper at eka.govt.nz or Mike Durand at mike.durand at pdp.co.nz to register your interest. ECA is also supporting carbon and energy professionals, or CEP, to provide training for suitably qualified professionals who, re who will review and make recommendations on emissions plans. Next slide, please. Uh, shown here are additional information around the national direction, which can be found on MFE's website, and also information on ECA's co-funding and support to assist with industrial process heat decarbonisation projects. These slides will be posted on the market update date insights page, so links will soon be able to be accessed through there. Well, thank you all for listening. Please reach out in the Zoom Q&A function if you have any questions. Um, and I'll now pass you over to our next presenter, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Paps, and I'm the um, Supplier Engagement Lead for the Clean Tech team here at IGA. Uh, first slide, please, Leroy. 
Uh, as a broad overview, the Giddy Cleantech team offers help for businesses in the commercial and industrial sectors with installing and upgrading to off-the-shelf energy-efficient equipment and solutions needed to run a business day-to-day. -day. This nationwide scheme provides co-funding to businesses to encourage them to switch to energy-efficient equipment. Next slide, please. The Cleantech team are responsible for administering the hot water heat pump program, the Giddy Commercial Buildings Program, as well as, well as pilot programs looking at potential opportunities in the commercial LED lighting and electric motor system spaces. Today, I'm here to talk to you specifically about the Giddy Cleantech Hot Water Heat Pump Program. Next slide, please. So the Hot Water Heat Pump Program was launched in July 2023 and aims to help businesses replace inefficient electric or fossil fuel boiler systems with the latest in hot water heat pump technology. This technology has proven to be much more energy efficient when compared with existing hot water systems, meaning that not only will businesses be reducing their carbon footprint by moving to hot water heat pumps, they will also be using less energy and saving money on their energy bills. The program criteria is simple. Projects must have a total value of less than $150,000, and the new system being installed must be a minimum of 15 kilowatts. Typically, the water use for these projects will be above 1,500 litres per day, and the new system should run off existing electrical infrastructure and require little to no engineering design. What we are going for here is a plug and play approach. Remove the old system and install the new. Next slide, please. So how can businesses access the program? This, shot, this slide shows you how the program works. Initially, businesses can request a site inspection and quote from one or more members of our approved installers panel. From there, the installer will design a system to meet the specific needs of the customer and submit this proposal to ECA, to ECA on behalf of the customer via an online application form for pre-approval. From here, ECA will review the application and confirm that it meets the required criteria for co-funding. If so, the project will be given formal approval. Customers will then receive a formal quote from the installer, confirmation of eligibility for a co-funding amount of up to 50% of the total project cost, as well as an indication of their potential energy and operating cost savings. At this point, the installer will be free to enter into a contract for installation with the customer. Once the project has been completed, the installer will claim the co-funding amount back from ECA. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what do we expect these projects to look like? The following examples are not actual submissions, but are based off data we have gathered and information from customers we are talking to, to demonstrate what great projects might look like. <clears throat> First example is a dairy farm. A dairy farmer is looking to replace the old electric boiler system with a hot water heat pump system. They require 2,500 litres of 90 degrees C hot water per day, seven days a week, to hot wash their dairy shed. Their accredited installer designs a hot water heat pump system using a single 30 kilowatt heat pump unit. Based on this design, their project would be approved for 40% co-funding through the hot water heat pump program, which contributes $32,000 to the total cost of the project. By upgrading equipment, this dairy farm is estimated to save $20,000 in operating costs, 8.7 tonnes of CO2 and 89,200 kilowatt hours of energy use every year. Next slide, please. A beverage manufacturer. A beverage manufacturer requires 3,500 litres of 90 degrees C hot water per day to pasteurise the product to 85 degrees C before it is bottled. They currently use a cylinder heated using uh, an electric element. They want to move to a more energy efficient solution to save money and position their brand as environmentally friendly. Working with an accredited, an accredited installer, they decide to move to a 40 kilowatt hot water heat pump. Based on their water usage and equipment, this project is approved for 30% co-funding through the hot water heat pump program, which contributes $26,800 uh, $26, to the total cost of the project. Through this project, the beverage manufacturer is estimated to save $22,000 in operating costs, 9.1 tonnes of CO2, and 93,700 kilowatt hours of energy use every year. Next slide, please. 
A private hospital requires 3,850 litres of hot water, hot water per day at a temperature of 70 degrees C to provide hospital level care for their patients. They currently use a diesel boiler and want to switch to a cleaner, more reliable system. Their accredited installer designs a hot water heat pump system made up of two 15 kilowatt heat pump units that run in parallel. The hospital has two peak hours during the day which require 1200 litres of hot water per hour. The two heat pumps will run for five hours overnight to fill up the 2400 litre tanks. Based on their equipment and water use details, this private hospital project is approved for 41% co-funding through the hot water heat pump program, which contributes 28,800 to the total project cost. Through this project, the hospital is estimated to save $8,100 in operating costs and a huge 24 tonnes of CO2 per year. This equipment upgrade upgrade will remove their diesel costs of around $12,000 per year and will add approximately $4,000 to their annual electricity bill. Next slide, please. A boutique hotel has two 70 kilowatt gas boilers that provide hot water for hotel rooms as well as for heating radiators throughout the building. They require 2,400 litres per day at a temperature of 60 degrees C. Their accredited installer advises that they should upgrade to three five kilowatt hot water heat pump units. These units will generate hot water and store it in three 800 litre storage tanks, one for each storey of the building. The hot water from the storage tanks will provide potable hot water and heat radiators throughout the building. Based on their equipment design and water usage, their, pro their project is approved for 41% co-funding through the hot water heat pump program which contributes $20,600 to the total project cost. This equipment upgrade is estimated to save $9,900 in operating costs and 14.6 tonnes of CO2 per year. This equipment upgrade will remove their gas costs of around $12,000 per year and will add approximately $2,100 to their annual electricity bill. Next slide, please. So as you can see, these. From these examples, we believe there is, you know, there are potentially some amazing carbon reduction and operating cost savings to be had by commercial and industrial customers when they upgrade their hot water heating system to a more energy efficient solution. We are really excited to have this program up and running to support businesses to accelerate the switch away from fossil fuels and to future proof their assets. If you'd like any further information, please check out the links uh, in the slide. Um, and that's all from me today. So I'll pass you on to Camilla to talk about transport. Michael. Yeah, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, next slide, please. I'll just give you a bit of a um, flavour of what we're focusing on in the transport space in uh, ECA and um, the, the, my team in particular, but um, obviously there's a, there's a big focus across the whole of the organisation uh, to support the government's EIP targets. Um, there's some pretty challenging targets in, in the transport space. Um, one example would be that uh, there's a 25% reduction in freight emissions required by 2035. Um, and given that heavy vehicles emit almost a quarter of transport emissions, uh, and most of these are freight vehicles, uh, you know, it's quite a, quite a big job ahead of us. Uh, and so we're working with uh, Ministry of Transport on the National Freight and Supply Chain Strategy. So that's kind of added another string to our bow on, on the transport space. Um, but just a bit of a, more of a general point, uh, looking across the market, uh, you know, in order to hit some of our targets, we need to have um, over 5 million electric vehicles on the car by 2043. Uh, you know, we, sorry, there's going to be 5 million vehicles on the road. If we swapped all of them straight away to EVs, uh, that would only solve one problem. We would still have all the other problems with car parking, congestion, road traffic, uh, electricity availability and, and other things. So what we've tried to do is uh, have a focus on a few key areas which will help us help the market uh, make that shift that's required. And so a few things we're looking at are fleet electrification, uh, looking at the need to get people actually out of cars and into alternative transport modes, and also looking for low emissions options for freight, as I mentioned before. Um, one of the things we do is stimulate the uptake of low emission solutions. Uh, and I'll talk about our low emission transport fund in a moment. The purpose of it really uh, is for us to be able to create and curate knowledge and share that amongst the market for further replication. 
Um, and a lot of this is really innovative stuff that hasn't been seen in New Zealand before. Uh, and we're looking really to to help accelerate the market and and you know share that and and reduce the barriers for other people. Uh, next slide, please. So our primary uh, vehicle to market is the Low Emission Transport Fund, which um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you will have come across before. Um, we've actually been running uh, since, well, I think it's 2016. Um, the objective, as I said, is to accelerate transport decarbonisation uh, with replicable projects that other people can learn from. So we've supported something like 300 projects um, over the last few years since launch. Uh, covering heavy light vehicles, uh, battery technologies, a uh, lot of public char char charging infrastructure, something like 1,300 charges in place already and more uh, coming every day. And more recently, we opened into off-road uh, vehicles and marine vessels and technologies. Uh, and just a note on the last three rounds, I know uh, some people have been waiting for their results. Um, that'll be announced very soon. Um, just a note, I'd encourage you to get in touch if you've got any ideas for projects. Uh, we actually do have two funding rounds open at the moment, so now's a good time to talk to us, but it's always a good time to talk to us because we'll have more uh, funding rounds coming uh, in future. Uh, and just a note on a Low Emission Transport Fund, um, public sector is excluded because it has other funding, uh, but certainly do talk to us anyway. Um, we have a lot of projects that have a lot to offer in terms of their learnings and uh, connections into the industry. Uh, next slide, please. So going back to those four key areas of focus on my first slide, uh, one of uh, ECA's focuses is to look at transforming how Kiwis consider transport for short journeys and longer journeys. Uh, and it's probably worth mentioning how much Kiwis love their cars. We have one of the highest rates of car ownership in the world, um, something like 850 cars per thousand people. Uh, and as I said before, we're expecting to uh, keep keep buying more. Um, and so even things like focusing on trips under two kilometers um, can make a massive difference to emissions. Uh, we make two billion car trips a year under two kilometers. And if we could swap some of those into uh, alternative modes, cycling, uh, car share, uh, and other options, um, that would really make um, a really big difference. So our Genless uh, uh, program has shared a lot of really inspirational stories about what uh, consumer, public sector, and business people are doing in the market where people have taken action and, and seen amazing results. So we do also support a lot of these projects through the Low Emission Transport Fund. Um, and in fact, we've got some new insights pieces coming out um, very soon on heavy vehicles. Um, and so, look, if people are interested in that, please do get in touch. They will be on our website soon. The second area of focus is on removing barriers to entry. Um, and largely, this is to do with public charging infrastructure. Uh, we have supported a number of fast chargers uh, already. And our focus in the future is going to be getting more of the super fast charging hubs into the ground, uh, working uh, with the wider industry to encourage wider take up and more participation from more, uh, more suppliers out there and more players uh, to really uh, increase the access and availability uh, and also provide more competition in the market. We're also focusing on the wider community. So equity uh, and access are really important making sure that people in all walks of life and in all places in New Zealand have got access to EV charging. And um, there's a number of programs out there that are looking at, you know, uh, car share options, uh, lower cost uh, EVs, and we're looking to, uh, to support all of these uh, types of uh, programs and uncover new opportunities to help overcome uh, barriers. Um, I mentioned that we've been working through the Low Emission Transport Fund, um, the third area there. Again, it's not a subsidy. Uh, we look for new use cases, new sectors, new types of vehicles, new manufacturers, anything that can be replicated and is, is, is new and interesting and provides a learning point for the market. I mentioned we've got two funding rounds open at the moment. So it's vehicles and technologies and off-road. And our second round open at the moment is marine um, decarbonization. We're seeing some really, really interesting ideas coming through, even if they don't necessarily come into this funding round, they might come into the next one. 
if you've got ideas, please do come and talk to us. We learn so much from talking to you. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that's something that we're really keen to keep going on. And the fourth area is extending support for freight decarbonisation. As I mentioned before, that really high target um, that New Zealand uh, is focusing on. Uh, and so we'll be demonstrating a lot more technologies, uh, software. We've got uh, transport decarbonisation dashboards coming to market uh, within the next month, um, which will enable fleet managers to really understand what the uh, data from the telematics is telling them and help them make decisions uh, on decarbonisation for the future. Uh, which will also help, you know, de-risk any any investments that they make, and uh, also help us to gather insights um, across uh, the market. Uh, and we're also looking at um, a new type of program which will support uh, the purchase cost of heavy vehicles, uh, non-public transport buses, and heavy vans. Um, and this takes it a little bit beyond the demonstration side. This is more about rolling out vehicles as they're coming in. And partly what we're wanting to do with that is encourage the manufacturers overseas to bring more vehicles to New Zealand. Until now, um, there hasn't been a huge amount of choice. Uh, and so that's something that we're really hoping to address through the influence that we have and, and the co-funding we can use to support it. Um, so largely that's what's happening in the transport area. Uh, please uh, come and see me, uh, drop, drop us an email if you've got any questions. Um, always happy to 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 help and have a chat about what's going on out there. Uh, that's it for me. Um, thanks, Glenn. I'll pass it on to you. Kia ora koutou, everybody. I'm Glenn Wellington, Manager of Products Partnerships. Um, my late cameo here is really just to coordinate questions, and there's been a number already in the chat, but if you have got questions, please please add them in the chat. Um, we've still got a bit of time left. Um, there's, there's a few come through already. Sarah, you're the most popular so far, um, so I'll... I've just sort of played a few here for you. Um, there was an early question just around what about applications that use fossil fuels that don't have emissions? I suppose this is probably meaning the application of carbon capture and storage and the likes like that and how that might be considered. Thanks, Glenn. Yeah, good question. Yep, we've got uh, CCS, carbon capture and storage. Um, this probably, this would fall under MFE. They've led the policy intent, et cetera, um, around this national direction. However, um, I'm, my thoughts are that we'll follow standard greenhouse gas accounting. So we'll be looking at what is the total emissions from that site? Does it fall below or above the consent threshold of 500 CO2 um, equivalent per year? And that's, where that consent threshold will lie. So yeah, following um, greenhouse gas accounting um, rules and and what the total emissions are from that site. And it's largely connected to the discharge consent essentially anyway, so that, that would be the guidance there, I assume. Um, cool, thanks for that. Um, just a question around how the councils are going to work with this. Obviously, this, this regulation comes in in parallel or as part of their existing consenting processes when it comes to their discharge. I believe so, yeah, that will be done in parallel with the current consenting. Cool. What you're and, yeah. Um, and I suppose the follow on part of that question was, you know, there's a lot, lot of uh, a lot of businesses out there who will be above the 500 tonne threshold. Um, just, a, just a question or if we're aware of how, how councils might identify those that don't currently have to do a consenting process, but will now as a result of this, and, and then sort of the question of, you know, is Zika helping with that process? Yeah. Um, so MFE are leading the implementation of this policy um, and regulation, so they are working with regional councils um, in uh, implementing this policy and also getting help from MB and ECA around the implementation um, and, and identification of sites, etc. Cool. There's a few questions around the suitably qualified person. Do you want, I can probably take that, or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, you can take it. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you, you, you chime in if, the, um, if I'm, uh, I get this wrong. So there's a number of questions around, you know, who, who defines a suitably qualified person, um, how, to, how to become a suitably qualified person, SQP, um, and, and sort of the technical skills required. There's a, there's a fact, fact sheet, um, there's guidance, um, 
on the MFE website around around this, the guidance of the technical skill skills required. There's there's essentially well, one key thing is um, sort of qualified persons are supporting councils in the review of these um, currently house case plans, and um, there's sort of three pathways for a, a council to identify um, a certified qualified person. So. Um, they're all outlined in, the, in that fact sheet um, based on skills and experience and within the guidance. One of those, though, and 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 uh, we have been working with CEP to establish a, a SQP accreditation, so that that will will be um, a live option. Um, still some work underway to finalise that, um, but yeah, refer you to that fact sheet um, or the or the details on the MFE website. That's you, Sarah, off the hook for now anyway, as, unless there's more questions in that area. Um, Michael, you may have asked, answered a couple already, but um, just, just the question, maybe for the broader audience, uh, have any Giddy Clean Tech um, applications been approved? I know we've, you know we've had a number of applications that was mentioned earlier, and, and similar question, have there been any um, commercial buildings um, projects approved? Um, so we're currently in the process of approving a number of applications in the hot water heat pump program and uh, I believe the same is the case for the commercial buildings. Um, as far as the commercial lighting pilot goes, we've, we've uh, approved um, yeah, a significant number of projects in, in that pilot program. And look, just, just a note from me that the usual rules apply here that because we're a government entity, uh, when things are approved, um, or when they're at the level of the size level of the commercial buildings, um, we'll probably need to wait for the minister to make the announcement. Mm. Um, but when the uh, heat pump ones are approved, I think we'll probably be quite free to relay that. Mm -hmm. Sort of related, I'll turn this into a general question and whether this maybe you, Nikki or Michael, just um, the installer panels, um, will they be open again, the option to register for those as a, I assume as an installer? Um, yes, we're absolutely looking at that right now. Uh, there may be people out there who are aware that because this is all brand new, we wanted to start small and start with people who are really experienced in this area. And then once we had the program humming, we could then open it up as widely as possible. What we're trying to achieve is, is the biggest scale possible. Um, we're not going to be rushing to do that, though, because we need to wait and see the outcome of the election and see what happens to the program in October. So if all goes well and, and we have no reason to think it won't go well because the program's just got so much value to it, then we are hoping that we may be able to open the panel early in the new year. Cool. Thanks, Nikki. Um, possibly related, really different, different focus. Uh, question around... Uh, there there was, hasn't been really much mention of um, GIDI infrastructure funding when it comes to electrification, uh, support for electric, electricity infrastructure. Is, is there just an update on that? Sure, I might, might cover that question and the construction one as well. So in terms of mm -hmm. GIDI infrastructure funding, um, we, we've only had a, a couple of inquiries under that. So we've intentionally, mm -hmm. with the infrastructure funding, we've intentionally been super flexible um, super bespoke so that we can pivot to what's needed and to date the way that we've been operating that has been following a regional report in a region which has really highlighted what the upstream inf infrastructure blockages are and who downstream is being prevented from decarbonising and will, will benefit from them um, to then move to have roundtable discussions with the local distribution network and with Transpower as well um, so what we're expecting is that it's probably quite unlikely that any recipient of infrastructure funding would not be an EDB because it's all shared infrastructure within the distribution network. That's more likely to be the case. Um, there could be there, there could be situations where Transpower, in theory, could be the one who could make an application, but Transpower's actually said that um, it, it doesn't need our support, which is wonderful, uh, that it's, it's pretty organised on that front and it's got more regulatory help to make the proactive investment uh, compared to the distribution networks who are really stuck in this just-in-time regulatory setting. Um, so yeah, we've, we've got a couple of inquiries um, with us on the electricity front. Of course, we've got the biomass infrastructure, ROI and RFP. Um, we had a huge number of respondents on the Biomass South Island ROI 
and we were just about to launch the RFP. We we're really excited about the proposals and the value. Um, the, the marginal abatement costs per tonne of CO2 abatement potential there through investing up the supply chain is off the charts. It's absolutely fantastic. But we've just made a really d difficult decision to put it on hold pending the outcome of the election because it just wasn't fair um, to ask people to invest in all that time and money that you know you do um, when you when you're responding to an RFP. So we're getting things ready so that we can launch that um, as soon as we get the green light. And then on the construction question, actually in Giddy Industrial we have uh, we have funded some projects in the construction sector, and it's probably more uh, an issue of um, that market not being aware of what we can do. Um, so we've absolutely, Glenn will be aware and the best person to talk about what we've done in the tech demo space in terms of co-investment. But in Giddy Industrial, that's absolutely available um, for yellowware investments, where there is site equipment that's operating on diesel, for example, that it's not a transport situation, it doesn't leave the site, and we are switching that to electric, where there is available technology, um, sometimes can make huge uh, have huge abatement outcomes. I know Camilla will just be in her seat itching like this to get in and, and talk about what her LETF fund can do for the construction industry as well. But uh, look, where there are abatement outcomes, um, doesn't matter what the industry is, there has to be a reduction of existing emissions. We're not here for new emissions in terms of the, um, the, the parameters of the funding that were given by Cabinet, um, but absolutely. Mm. Cool. Um, and I'll, I'll take, there's a related question here to the hotel industry. So um, ECA does have a, a sector focus program uh, working across a number of um, uh, energy and sort of carbon intensive sectors and, and that program will continue to extend. And we have, we are working with the hotel industry um, and more broadly in the commercial building space, um, commercial office buildings, retirement villages and aged care and hotel industry. So, um, yeah, you can look to our website or get in touch more directly. Um, uh, uh, that's that's an engagement channel, but it, it, it helps businesses um, navigate sort of energy efficiency and decarbonisation, and and then ultimately access potentially access um, programs that are applicable um, when it comes to broad funding. Um, um, I'll, I'll handle another question here around R and D, um, inventing a, a more efficient electric motor. Eka, we don't. Um, the likes of Callahan Innovation or Araki, when it comes to the R and D end of the, um, the spectrum, uh, 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 the organisations you should be talking to. Eka picks up um, with our, particularly with our tech demo program, where um, a technology is commercially available but new or underutilised in New Zealand. So, um, point you in that direction for a starter there. Um, when will the next RETA reports be released? Uh, Otago, I think the Otago region is due, is imminent. So um, um, I don't have the exact date for you right now, but we're talking um, sort of weeks, I believe. Uh, then we've got the remaining um, two South Island regions being North Canterbury, um, Nelson, Tasman, and we are underway in a number of North Island regions as well. So um, they, they will follow. Um, now, let, I think we're getting pretty much close to having covered all. Um, Wait, can I just take the, the clean tech question? It's a quite an easy one there. What, what does clean tech mean? And so yeah. when, when we did, uh, uh, when our data teams did their strategic analysis of the opportunity here and what could be achieved, um, four technologies were shortlisted. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that it was identified that these four technologies are in such widespread use in New Zealand and have such um, energy efficient and abatement, but primarily energy efficiency uh, potential if, they, if the uptake was, was much greater uh, that we could achieve these targets through those four alone. So it's really a whitelist approach. I'll tell you the four technologies, but once we get through those, we'll then, uh, we've then got a longer list of other technologies which will come on stream. So the first one is hot water heat pumps. And as you can see, we've started with uh, heat pumps that are 15 kilowatts or greater, um, but we do intend to go into heat pumps that are, that are smaller than that. The next one is commercial lighting. So we're talking about LED lighting there. Um, the third one is electric motor systems. And, uh, and then heat pumps for space heating as well. So they're, they're the top four. And between those four, um, 
you know, you quite often in this data situation got uh, a, a small number of um, actions that can achieve the volume of the targets, and after that, you, you go down into smaller um, ratios of, of bang for buck. But then we will look at uh, a range of other technologies after that, where um, we're looking at thermal screens, um, not as high priority as those four, but on the list. Uh, irrigation pumps are in there, although I think electric motor systems might might cover them. Uh, and if there are other technologies that we should be aware of and maybe we're not, then we definitely want to hear about them. So hopefully that's answered that question. Cool. Um, I might just give this one to you as well, Nikki. Um, just it's, it's sort of as there, it's around our funding and and whether we would be looking to fund um, energy energy or electricity, particularly generation projects. Um, you know, solar panels, wind turbines, or even co-gen from biofuels. Uh, it's it's a it's a bit of a tricky one, mm -hmm. and if if you are a business who's in the middle of nowhere, you can't you can't access a network, um, and we want you to be electrifying, or choosing biomass. If for some reason biomass is not available, then I think the position would be that absolutely Giddy would be supporting what you need to do on that site given the lack of options. But if you're a business who has access to the electricity network, uh, then because Giddy looks at the incremental cost between the options available to you, uh, I think that we would be saying to you, um, well, why are you not electrifying? Mm -hmm. And that is the simplest path forward. So while we don't necessarily second guess and dictate what people do, we certainly um, apply a great deal of thought to what is most optimal in the situation. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, I could probably take this one um, regarding hot, heat, hot water heat pumps and is it feasible to achieve greater than 90 degrees Celsius hot water? Uh, and look, I, I've, rather than, yeah, uh, uh, there are technologies out there that are achieving that and we're currently looking at technologies that um, are greater than 100 degrees, but that uh, definitely depends on your scenario and, and you know, that that is pushing sort of pushing the, the new boundaries of um, of heat pumps. So um, happy if you want to get in touch directly. Um, that's anonymous here to me. So um, if you want to get in touch directly, we can connect you with our technology innovation manager and, and have that have have a discussion. Help help you with information there. Um, Sarah, there's just a a couple of questions related to mixed fuels and and um, with regard to the the RMA or the guidance. Um, and I think you've already said that, you know, the, the, the focus will be using um, greenhouse accounting rules, but if a site's using mixed fuels, you know, some sustainable, some fossil, um, um, and, I, and I think this, the other question's a bit related as a biomass, what do biomass user, um, and if their emissions are greater than 500 tonnes, um, yeah, how, how, does that, how does that sort of work? Yep, so um, for the national direction, the 500 tonnes CO2 equivalent per year, that consent threshold, that's only for fossil fuels. Um, so if you have biomass and you uh, have emissions over 500 tonnes CO2 equivalent um, per year, you, you don't need to go through the consent process because you're already using a low emissions fuel. Um, the fo fossil fuels are defined in the NES, so it, it covers a multiple of things. Um, so it's good to look in there and just have a look at what, what kind of fossil fuels are covered and what um, that can look lead to that 500 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year. Cool. Thank you. Camilla, maybe one, one for you. Um, are there any channels available um, in the transport space um, for hydrogen uh, refuse trucks? Yeah. Where these run as a demonstration? Yeah, look, ECA, um, the LETF, the Low Emission Transport Fund, does support uh, low emission uh, fueled vehicles. So if it's uh, hydrogen from green sources, then we would certainly look at it. Um, I suppose one thing that we consider in any application that we receive is what is the supply situation for hydrogen, um, knowing that, um, you know, a, a national network is a little way off, but coming. Uh, you know, what would you do in the meantime? Um, these are the sort of practical questions that we would ask you. 
uh, and and you know we're, we're wanting to support projects that are able to be implemented, uh, you know, within a reasonably short period of time. Uh, knowing you might have to order a truck or, or and it needs to come into the country, etc. Um, so I would say do talk to us. It's it's possibly a little harder to justify than some projects who, uh, you know, they can literally just plug into the wall and, and charge up their truck. So that's like I say, the supply chain um, side of it is, is really important for us to consider. Um, and there are a number of projects that we've got underway at the moment that we're waiting for results on as well. So that's, you know, we, we try and do new and different things each time. Um, so yeah, do, do get in touch if you are, if you are interested. Um, certainly really keen for a conversation. Cool. Um, yeah. Craig's uh, asking for a phone number. I won't put your, your mobile out over, over the airwaves there, Camilla, but Craig will, will um, uh, we'll, we'll get your contact details and then... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, good old. Talk soon. One last question. I think we might call it there because we're almost at time. Um, how is energy security being considered and the ability of a network and generators to support the initiatives encouraged by ECA? Um, any key findings from the Reiters to share? Look, uh, yes, obviously Rita is one... one um, yeah, looking at the supply side is certainly um, um, a key part of trying to help enable the, 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 the supply of energy, uh, sustainable energy to those big demand reduction projects we're looking to try and um, um, mobilise and, and get, get completed. Um, look, we're out of time to share the findings here, but I'm sure we will um, uh, continue updates on that um, and, 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 and be able to put some of those um, findings or learnings um, into the market. Um, um, at, at a future update. But if you want to get in touch with the team, um, yeah, there'll be some contact details shortly that um, uh, you can you can get in touch. Uh, look, we'll move on to the next slide because we're pretty much at time. Thank, thanks, everyone. Thanks to all the speakers again for, for presenting and thanks for all your uh, and, um, questions and, and actually just being online to listen today. So uh, we would normally have an agenda for our next um, ECA update, which is um, scheduled for early December. Um, uh, but we'd prefer probably to tailorize, uh, tailor our speakers' priorities um, you know, in the post-election environment. So we'll, we'll, we'll um, post that out um, in due course near that time and post-election, obviously. But until then, you know, we remain committed to, a, to our purpose, um, to mobilise New Zealanders to be world leaders in clean and clever energy use, and then ultimately our desired outcome, a sustainable energy system that supports uh, the prosperity and well-being of current and future generations. So, um, you know, we're committed to that and, and we'll keep, keep, keep working at that. So, um, look, there's some contact details there. The recording and the um, and the slides will be published on our website under uh, eager update things so area. So, um, again, thanks again. Uh, Namihi, uh, kia pai tada, and have a, have a great day, everyone. Thanks for attending.